Assessment of left atrial size is really important in small animal echocardiography. We see a dilated left atrium in the most common diseases that we see on a daily basis. Mitral regurgitation in dogs, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in cats, and even some of the less common conditions like dilated cardiomyopathy, or just general diastolic dysfunction, all of these will result in left atrial dilatation. So it's really important not only for diagnosis, but also for prognosis and for long-term follow-up. The next 10 minutes is a small excerpt adapted from a talk I did for First Opinion Veterinary Ultrasound in October. If you're looking to improve your abdominal ultrasound, the courses run by Dr. Camilla Edwards are an excellent place to start, and I will put the links down in the description below. In this video, we're going to recap on the appearance of normal chamber sizes on echocardiography, the role of the left atrium, and how to get from your first right parasternal long axis view to your basal short axis. We'll then begin looking at how this can start to inform your diagnosis. This is not an in-depth walkthrough on how to perform an LA-AO ratio. What I'm trying to encourage you to do for now is form a subjective opinion first, because ultimately that is what is going to make your measurements meaningful and reliable. So let's have a quick recap on normal chamber sizes in dogs and cats. The largest chamber should be the left ventricle with its thick muscular walls for pumping blood around the body. If I pause the video right here, you can see that the left ventricular outflow tract has just been opened up here. And this is where during systole, blood is ejected out through the left ventricular outflow tract and through the aortic valve and into the aorta to go around the entire body. So if this is the left ventricle, then the chamber feeding it here must be the left atrium. So you have blood coming in through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium, through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. Once you've figured that out, you know that on the other side of the interventricular septum, this must be the right ventricle. And just off the screen here is the right atrium. So your right ventricle and right atrium are your more anterior chambers. Once you can confidently recognise the left ventricle from a right parasternal long axis view, you should be able to recognise it everywhere you go from there, and even if you're looking at other images that maybe are not your own. So here's a left apical view, even if you don't take these images yet, if you haven't started moving on to the left side yet, I'm sure you can still now recognise where the left ventricle is. It's still going to be the larger, more muscular chamber. And once you've spotted that, then again, you can work out what everything else is, even if the view is completely unfamiliar to you. So this must be the left atrium, because here's the mitral valve. Blood is coming in through here into the left ventricle. So if you're ever a bit lost, identify the left ventricle, figure everything else out from there. Sometimes you can get unconventional views, you can put your probe on, things are not as you expected them to be. By working out what you're looking at, you can usually correct your view rather than getting frustrated. So let's focus a bit more on the left atrium now. So here it is again in the long axis, and here you have the left atrium in its short axis. So it's a 90 degree twist and a little bit of a cranial tilt, and I'll show you that in a moment. And here is an example in a cat. So just getting used to what normal looks like, normal size left atrium from the long axis and the short axis in a cat. Now before we go into how to take the right views, let's just recap over the role of the left atrium. It's actually more than just a reservoir or a conduit. It has its own contractile element, which can be seen in the second half of diastole in the atrial kick or A wave. So if you've taken these M mode traces before through the mitral valve, then you will recognize E and A waves. I'll play this for you in slow motion. And you can see this is the E wave, so this is when the mitral valve first opens, and then the A wave is when you get that second atrial kick. When the pressure falls in the left ventricle and it's below that of the left atrium, that's when the mitral valve opens here. 
and blood is sucked in. So this is sometimes called the passive filling stage. And once pressure equalises in the two chambers, the LA has to actively squeeze to transfer any more blood into the left ventricle. And that's your A wave there. It's this atrial kick that's lost in atrial fibrillation, for example. And it also struggles in conditions that raise diastolic pressures, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. When end diastolic pressures in the left ventricle are high, left atrial pressures have to raise as well. And that's what causes your dilatation in those conditions. And we'll return to this later. So how do you get the short axis view of the left atrium? So from your long axis, when you twist in place, you may find that you end up at papillary muscle level. So your view will look like that. But what you need to do is tilt cranially from that position towards the base of the heart, and that will bring the aortic valve and the left atrium into view. So this is a slow motion and slightly exaggerated video just to show you that movement, that tilt up towards the base of the heart from papillary muscle level. When you've done that, you'll have this view. This is a very well known, much loved and much hated view that you would take the LA-AO ratio from. The idea is that you pick the first frame when you see that the aortic valve is closed and you measure through the middle of the right coronary cusp and basically follow that join between the left and non-coronary cusps. So remember the non-coronary cusp is always going to be the one here where the interatrial septum is and then once you've figured out that that's a non-coronary cusp, again another process of elimination to work out where everything else is, this is the right side of the heart. Remember, it's more anterior, this is the right atrium, this will be the right ventricle and the right ventricular outflow tract. So if this is all the right side of the heart, then this must be the right coronary cusp. This is your left atrium, so this must be your left coronary cusp. The problem with this measurement is that the left atrium does not dilate uniformly. You may have a dilated left atrium in the right parasternal long axis or apical four-chamber view, but have a normal LAAO ratio and vice versa. There's also no real consensus on measurement technique at the moment, so you've probably heard of the Swedish method, the American method, but that's not really the main difference. There's other differences such as what to do when you uh, run into a pulmonary vein. Some people even like to make sure they always have a pulmonary vein in view. So there's a lot of differences in both how you take the view and how you perform your measurement on it. And finally, this measurement actually has quite poor reproducibility in real life. Reproducibility figures quoted in papers could be quite misleading because they tend to be taken on images acquired by the same expert operator. So even if they do provide data of reproducibility between operators, if they're all performing their measurements on the same images acquired by the same person, that's not a real life situation. That's nothing close to what is achievable between you and your colleagues or particularly between you and another vet practice where you might all be doing things a little bit differently. There are other measurements you can do. The linear dimension of the left atrium in the right parasternal long axis view is becoming very popular in cats and I go into these measurements further on my course but for all the reasons stated suffice to say it's absolutely vital that you can subjectively assess the size of the left atrium and that's perhaps even more important than being able to perform a measurement. So to give an extreme example, do you really need an LA-AO ratio to tell you that this left atrium is severely dilated? That's not to say that this measurement is not useful. It's very, very useful for serial follow-up, ideally by the same operator using the same technique. But for an initial diagnosis, the first time you're seeing that patient, you don't need an LAAO ratio to tell you that you have a dilated left atrium here. Remember, you can look at all of the images, so this would have been the first image you'd have got, a uh, right parasternal long axis view, and look how huge that left atrium is. We can see the cause here as well. And from the apical view, if you were to, to go onto the left side and get some apicals, again, huge left atrium. Look at the right atrium there in comparison, how tiny that looks compared to the huge left atrium. Let's just look at two more examples, both in the same disease. 
This three-year-old King Charles Cavalier Spaniel has a murmur, but is asymptomatic. You won't be surprised to hear that he has mitral valve disease. It's not that easy to spot on B-mode if you're new to echo. So let me try and pause it. So this is actually, where the valve is opened, this is actually your normal closing position. If you imagine these valves were closed and this was actually systole, not diastole, this would be where you'd expect the mitral valve leaflets to be closing around about here, kind of um, towards the apex from the mitral valve annulus. But can you see that the mitral valve leaflets actually are closing above the plane of the mitral valve annulus? So here's your annulus and they're closing behind it. So it's got bileaflet prolapse. I don't even need to show you the colour Doppler image for you to know that that dog is going to have significant mitral regurgitation. Here's the exact same view just using a microconvex probe. In case you don't have a phased array, you can still get all the information that you need on B mode with a microconvex probe. Here are his short axis views now. Phased array probe on the left, microconvex on the right, just to make sure everybody's included, no matter what equipment you use. And his left atrium is not looking massively dilated here. In the previous view, again, it did not look huge, and the left ventricle as well did not look massively dilated either. So in terms of ACVIM staging, for example, even before performing any measurements, it's looking likely that this dog is going to be a stage B1. So definitely he had a mitral regurgitation murmur. He clearly has signs of valve pathology on echo, but there are no significant echocardiographic or radiographic signs of cardiac remodeling. So he's likely to turn out to be a stage B1. Now this dog also has mitral valve disease. But the difference here is that cardiac remodelling has clearly occurred. Can you see how large this left atrium is here? And in the short axis, it's a really very dramatic dilatation that you see here. Compare it to the aorta here. Again, you don't need an LAAO ratio to actually tell you that. So because cardiac remodelling clearly has occurred, combined with all your other examinations, you're more likely to find that this dog is going to be a stage B2. I hope this video gave you a feel for what familiarity with the views and the normal proportions can do. You don't have to be able to perform a full quantitative echocardiogram to be able to obtain useful information about the heart using ultrasound. If you're struggling with echocardiography and you would like to build your confidence within a community of like-minded individuals, there'll be a link down in the description below where you can book a call with me or one of my team to discuss your needs and your suitability for our online echocardiography course. There's also an in-person scanning day coming up here in South East London with me, Doppler here, and Professor Virginia Luis Fuentes. Please get in touch if you would like more information about attending this day.